There are thorns in every path. All who follow the Lord's leading must expect to meet with disappointments, crosses, and losses. But a spirit of true heroism will help them to overcome these. Many greatly magnify seeming difficulties and then begin to pity themselves and give way to despondency. Such need to make an entire change in themselves. They need to discipline themselves to put forth exertion and to overcome all childish feelings. Everyone should have an aim and object in life. The loins of the mind should be girded up and the thoughts be trained to keep to the point as the compass to the pole. Worthy purposes should be kept constantly in view and every thought and act should tend to their accomplishment. Let it ever be a fixedness of purpose to carry out that which is undertaken. Read from The Faith I Live by, page 316. Hello friends and welcome to the Sabbath School study. This week's study is titled the crucibles that we come across. Before we could begin the study, let us all bow down for prayer. Dear God in heaven, we once again praise and thank you for giving us this opportunity where we can come and study your word, Lord, more deeply. And we pray that as we study and as we discuss, your Holy Spirit will be there throughout the discussion, Lord. Put your words in our mouth. Keep us from every distraction. Lord, may we not tell anything which you do not want us to tell. We pray, Lord, that everybody who is watching this and listening to this will be able to understand what is being said. Once again, Lord, we pray that you will take complete control over the study. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> So uh, this week's title, as I said, the crucibles that come, uh, we saw shepherd's crucible, but even before going into that, let us just look into what the crucible means. Uh, in the Sabbath school uh, book, in the lesson, a crucible is defined in the dictionary. We have several de uh, definitions. So the first one is, it is a vessel used for melting a substance that requires high degree of heat. Uh, the other definition is a severe test. And the other definition is a place or situation in which concentrated forces interact to cause or influence change or development. So, uh, it, it's very nicely put to study the crucible. The name crucible is very apt. Uh, in simple words, to just say that crucible can be a test or a trial or a situation that God is putting us into for us for, to refine us and to change us and to uh, perfect our character, which is very, very necessary for us to undergo before we could enter the kingdom of God. Uh, tests and trials is one topic, one subject which no one wishes to enter into uh, because we all want peace in our lives. We all want life where there is no trials, where there are no uh, difficulties. But I could say it's a bitter truth that tests and trials are a necessity for us Christians to enter into heaven. And it will be quite severe because sinless pair in the Garden of Eden, they were sinless and they had to go through a test. We being sinful, to get into that state, to go into a state, to uh, go into a character, to become perfect in character, we will have to go through many tests and trials. But the good news is we have Christ along with us and he's already 
uh, shown us the path. That's what we saw last week. And all we need to do is just follow that path. This week, we are more going to concentrate on what sort of tests and trials we're going to come. Why is it necessary? Uh, what purpose that God has in that for us? Uh, we should understand that the peace that Christ gives us is not as the world gives. So when we decide to be a Christian, when we want to be true to God, when we want to be there in the kingdom of heaven, we have to go through test, tests and trials. Uh, we cannot have this false uh, hope that once I am a true Christian and I've accepted Jesus as my savior, I'm never going to have any problems because that's just the opposite. The minute you start accepting Christ as your savior, we are going to have more and more tests and trials. So going into the lesson study, uh, the memory verse is uh, from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, it says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So moving into the first, uh, the Sunday's lesson, uh, we see Peter writing here, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fi fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. And this is exactly what all of us think. That's why uh, the apostle is writing there. We all find it very strange when we are going through trials. We've, um, you know, for, for example, if if I have to, if if I have to tell in my life, I was born a Catholic, and I used to have trials and temptations. And initially, when I started accepting the truth, I thought everything is going to be smooth. And every trial that came my way, I found it very strange because I was a Catholic and there were trials too. Now I've started to accept my savior. I've given up so many things and the trials are just continuing to be there and that too of a greater degree. And I don't know how to go about with it initially, but, uh, Thank, I'm just thanking God that I'm learning how to go through with it every day. Uh, why do we have to undergo trials? Why is it necessary? What do you think, Sam? Well, there are, the lesson I've given is beautifully classified the uh, trials into different categories. And uh, we can, for practical purposes, we can divide it into two categories. Trials that we undergo because of our own foolishness. Trials that are not designed by God or it's not intended by God for us to undergo or for us to face. But because of our own uh, actions, maybe a sin that we commit or maybe, uh, maybe we chose something that is not right and because of our choice, we are facing a lot of trials. So a good example would be marrying a non-believer or maybe marrying somebody from another church. Bible gives us clear counsel that we should not be united with unbelievers. But when things like that happen and then the life of suffering, it follows because of our own actions as a consequence of what we chose. And included in that category would be since Every sin that we commit has a consequence, and it is it is not that God punishes us because of the sin. For example, if we smoke, which is not a good thing, we will have cancer as a result of it. It's not that we got cancer because God chose to punish you or punish us for the smoking that we did. Cancer doesn't come as a result of punishment from God but rather as a consequence of smoking because the substance in that 
cigarette or video, whatever we smoke, whatever smoke, it, it has a property to cause cancer. Similarly, a lot of things come up bundled with their own consequences. And many a times we suffer not because God has seen God sees that it's necessary for us to undergo the suffering for our character's perfection, but rather because of our own sins. That is one category. We suffer as a consequence of our action, be it sinful or non-sinful or, or sinless. It doesn't matter. Uh, uh, good example for that. Sinless, sinless thing that can cause a very bad consequence would be, for example, maybe eating flesh. God has given a warning that in the last days flesh should be contaminated and by eating the flesh even of few animals we may end up suffering from diseases and as a result even though it is not a sin to eat the flesh but by eating it we are placing ourselves in a position where we will face a consequence of what we did maybe we will have heart disease or maybe we will have a peripheral vascular disease or something some disease might result as a, as a result of our lifestyle which may not exactly be sinful as such. But so we can divide this into either sins, sins that cause suffering or maybe things that are not sinful, but yet due to the foolishness of the action might have consequences that cause us to suffer. And we might think that it is a crucible that God has put us into. Many a times this happens. Uh, I remember reading a quotation from Ellen White uh, in her times, uh, in her times, uh, uh, babies dying is a very common, common occurrence, and that's the reason why people at those days they used to have 10, 12 kids, or even if three or four die, they have uh, remaining children. And uh, and she writes many times, people think God has given me such a great trial. So many of my children have died, or my son has died, my daughter has died. But in the records of heaven, she says it will be written on the grave died due to improper diet given to the child by the mother or by the improper food provider or improper lifestyle taught by the parents. And so many times what we think of as a crucible given to us by God, we may think God took away a child, but the child might have died because of our own foolishness or because, of our, because we were inconsiderate and we did not understand the principles of how to bring the child up. As a consequence of this, it might have happened. We don't know. So, so uh, that is an example of suffering because of our own foolishness, yet thinking that it is God who gives. And then there is a second category, which is given to us by God. Sometimes God permits Satan to bring suffering, as in the case of Job. And Job suffered uh, not because God himself gave Job that test, but rather because God permitted Satan, and Satan simply came to make Job suffer. The, the purpose of that crucible was simply, from the heart of Satan, was to simply cause suffering to Job. The crucibles that come from God, they are not like that. Their goal is not to cause us to suffer, but rather for our edification. Um, as we read in uh, Peter, when we suffer, and especially when we suffer for Christ's sake, which is the crucible that God allows us to go into, we are partaking of the sufferings of Christ. So when Christ is revealed in his glory, we should also be glorified together with him. So there is a beautiful thing. Crucibles of our own making, which we which we go and do because of our of the God as a consequence of our actions, crucibles that are brought about by Satan and his um, angels. I would say Satan is a fiery lion seeking whom he may devour. Continuously he is looking at us and especially at God's people and thinking what he can do to make lives miserable. The third category is are the crucibles of God. These crucibles, they come to refine us. Sometimes they may come to help us understand that we have a sinful character in us. So many times, when we start following Christ, we see we, there are obvious errors in us which we can see, understand, and correct. But then there are a lot of hidden things 
which we don't really realize that we have. We think we have surrendered entirely, but there may be elements in us which are again which are still rebelling against God. And God brings in those crucibles for us to understand when when we may think that we are very humble, but when God puts us in a crucible, the situation might be such that it brings out a, a, a hidden stream or a hidden a, a hidden trait of pride. And then we know, oh, so we did have pride in us. We were thinking we were so humble. That was not the case. And so God brings principles reveal to us a character so that we will understand the hidden things of uh, hidden things in our own heart. Because Bible says, who can know his own heart? The heart is receptive of all things. And it has a powerful ability to deceive ourselves. We tend to think we are good, but actually, in actual reality, we are bad. And so the heart deceives us, and God puts us into this crucible so that we understand our own nature. We understand that we are not whom we think we are, and that selfishness is still very strong and it's still holding tight. And by understanding this, we can choose to submit our lives to God and get rid of that trait of character. So that is one reason God brings us into. And then the lesson beautifully says the other reason would be for our maturity. So that, that's in the case of Paul. Paul was not given a crucible uh, so that he can uh, he can get better or he can get rid of sin, but rather he was given a crucible so that he will be prevented from sinning, that he will be prevented from uh, becoming proud. And so it acted as a safeguard barrier for Paul and it prevented him. Maybe if we don't know because Paul did not commit any sin, but had it not been given, we don't know what would have happened. Sometimes God permits certain uh, crucibles for that purpose. And so uh, this is uh, this is why crucibles come in our life, either as a consequence of our own action or because of the action of the enemy or because God permits certain things to come in so that we can see who we are and we can change. And we could become more and more mature fit for the new work. We saw that God permits trials and death. He does not uh, uh, he doesn't take pleasure in our distress or affliction. There's a reason why he allows this process because this process is essential. I would like to read a quotation from the Faith I Live by page 317, which says by God's mighty cleaver of truth. We have been taken from the quarry of the world and brought into the workshop of the Lord to be prepared for a place in his temple. In this work, the hammer and chisel must act their part and then comes the polishing. Ripple not under the process of grace. You may be a rough stone on which much work must be done before you are prepared for the place God assigns you to fill. You need not be surprised if with the hammer and the chisel of trial, God cuts away your defects of character. He alone can accomplish this work and be assured that he will not strike one useless blow. We see that the trials are required to cut the defects in a character which only God knows. There are few defects which are open to the world, but there are few defects which only God knows. And we cannot enter into heaven with these defects. So one other purpose of uh, the tests and trials that come our way is for us to see the defects in our character that we have and the defects to be gone. Now, when we have tests and trials, how are we to be, especially when uh, tests come from, when, when trials are given by God, the crucible that God gives, uh, how are we to uh, be, we are not to manifest a spirit which is very mournful and we cannot appear grievous. We have to be ever careful. We see in the Testimonies for Church, Volume 6, page 365, the bright and cheerful side of our religion will be represented by all who are daily consecrated to God. 
we should not dishonor God by the mournful relation of trials that appear grievous. All trials that are received as educators will produce sorrow. We see that trials produce sorrow, but we can allow the trials to produce joy if we receive it as a learning process for us. The crucibles that come that God allows is not just for us to change, but also for the world to look at us as being as a, being a living testimony for God. For example, we see how uh, during the dark ages, uh, we see what converted the people when the other people saw the believers being killed, being burned alive at the stake, how cheerful they were even at the death, at the point of death. Even we, when trials come our way, we are to be cheerful. We are to maintain a peaceful attitude. By doing so, we might not know. There are other people noticing and they will want to know who our God is. They will want to know from where we're getting that peace. And the very trial which taxes us so much can be a way of bringing a non-believer into the tree. We see, uh, we also saw there are crucibles of Satan. We see that Satan is moving around seeking to devour people. Now, how uh, we see that watch and pray. How does Satan do this? In Maranatha page 90, it says that uh, the Satan, uh, what the Satan does is he, uh, yeah, we see that, uh, we see we need to be vigilant, we need to be watchful, and we need to be careful. We are to keep close to the side of Christ. We see uh, how Satan leads us away from God is with worldly entanglements, error, and superstition. This is how Satan strives to win Christ's followers from him. We should be sure that we are not connected to the world in any ways, in any ways, be it through things or through relationships. If it is leading us, with the minute we realize that it is leading us away from Christ, we need to cut off from all those things. We have to always be on the side of Christ. Uh, I would also like to read another quotation from the Desire of Ages, page 490, which says that we are to look upon Satan as a conquered foe. Sometimes we might feel, uh, because we know that the next, the most powerful person in this world after God, uh, Godhead is Satan. But we should also be sure that when we have God with us, we are powerful because we will have Jesus by our side. So we are not to look Satan as someone who is powerful than us and we are not able to conquer because Jesus has conquered him for us. Upon the cross, Jesus was to gain the victory for them. That is the people who look to him. That victory he desired them to accept as their own. The Savior is by the side of his tempted and tried one. With him, there can be no such thing as failure, loss, impossibility, or defeat. We can do all things through him who strengthens us. When temptations and trials come, do not wait to adjust all the difficulties, but look to Jesus, your helper. There are Christians who think and speak altogether too much about the power of Satan. They think of their adversary, they pray about him, they talk about him, and he looms up greater and greater in their imagination. It is true that Satan is a powerful being, but thank God, we have a mighty savior who cast out the evil one from heaven. Satan is pleased when we magnify his part. Why not talk of Jesus? 
why not magnify his power and his love? So this is an other way to overcome trials and temptations. When we are going through difficulties, we are to look back and see how wonderfully God has led step by step. We have to see the miracles which God had performed in our lives. We have to open the Bible and see the miracles God performed in the life, lives of Israelites. See what all Jesus performed. We need to talk of God's mighty, uh, uh, God's might and the wonderful work that he has done. And these also will be a source of strength for us to overcome the trials that come our way. Uh, it's very essential that we take time every day and we keep talking also to others about the glory of God. Uh, glorifying God's name means that we choose this way and we choose to follow it. Well, we have to have Christ abiding in us heart so that Christ will be in all our thoughts. As we are in we are in the last day, until and unless we manifest the character of Christ, the second coming of Christ is going to be delayed. It is time that all of us have to uh, we we've already we've already started undergoing this process. We are facing trials and temptations, but how are we through the trial? How are we manifesting ourselves? Or I would say a process of grace. That's what the trials is a process of grace. God uh, wants us to after. So how are we trial? Are we handling it better? Are we becoming better person? Or are we becoming worse? Are we becoming more weak? Let us examine ourselves. Let us try to look at the trials as something where see if uh, if I want to pass and go to another if I'm in a school I can move to the next grade only if I pass the test. If I don't, then I can't move to the next grade. I can't learn anything more new. I can't reach that level. Same way, until and unless we reach that level, until we have a character, uh, Christ-like character, we will be, uh, you know, getting through the passing. We, uh, we will be having these tests. And we need to pass in every test to prove ourselves worthy of going through another test and hence uh, obtaining the character of the test. So we need to remember two things. We need to always pray and ask God for his help. And when we pray, we need to claim the promises which are there for us in the Bible. Because the promises are there for us to read and to claim them. God is waiting that we pray to him by telling these promises out loud and claiming these promises and he's ever ready to help us. So we are to continue to read those verses which will strengthen us, those verses which has the promise that God will never leave us. And we need to pray to God we need to include all those promises in our prayer, especially when we are uh, tested and tested. So that will be a very powerful tool and a weapon for us to overcome the evil and the Satan and to become more right. Thank you, friends, for joining us. We pray that uh, all who are watching this video will be blessed by uh, this study and that we will start uh, looking at our trials from different views and that we will be able to surrender ourselves to God. Before we could end the study, I like Sam to close with the prayer.
Thank you for showing us that we need to undergo trials for the initiative factor for removing kids' desires and thoughts from our lives, for finding out the difference of Kerala and polishing them until they become proper. Well, thank you for showing us that our lives have been examples for others and others who see our life and been influenced for good or for evil. Help us, God, to face the trials that come our way with joy and to take all the help available to you. And Lord, uh, help us to understand what is the lesson you want us to learn and learn that lesson so that we'll be good students in the school of Christ. Father, help us to pass this thing to him so that when Jesus comes, the Lord, the Lord be found going with him and talking with him. So love you. Decide, Lord, to live our lives to glorify you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, friends. And let's meet in another study next week. Bye.